Good morning. Happy Friday. Woohoo! Let's take this day and make it ours. Whatever. Anyway, uh, today we're going to uh, continue on talking about chapter four, part one, which is the power of the balanced reaction, the sentence in chemistry. And I'll show you some techniques and stuff on how to solve problems like this one right here. At 1 o'clock today, 1.10 p.m., uh, when you come to lab, we'll take the midterm exam. So bring a calculator, uh, something to write with. If you want to use a page of notes, that's totally cool. Staple it to the back of the end. Also, you'll turn in the exam prep one worksheet. Uh, we won't talk about it in class, uh, but I will look at it to see what's happening. And then you'll also turn in the empirical formula lab. Now, afterwards, we do have a lab. It's the percent potassium chlorate lab. So bring a printed copy of that along. It's kind of a cool lab. We get to just burn the heck out of some stuff. <laughs> to me, that sounds fun. I don't know why, but anyway, it does. But because we're burning things, make sure you bring some safety goggles if you've got them. I've got some if you don't have them. But if you've got your own, of course, it's cool. Now, my office hours today are a little wonky. I had an office hour at 8 because I've got a science division meeting at 9.30. I'm going to be late too, whatever. Um, but I do have an office hour at noon today. So if you want to stop by, that would be cool. Otherwise, I'll see you in lab at 1 o'clock. Any questions? This kind of jazz? Sweet. So this is the type of a reaction that you might want to balance. Okay. And in a balanced reaction, the first thing you need to know is what your reactants, which are the pieces to the left of the arrow, and what your products are. So in this reaction, this is propane, C3H8. It reacts with oxygen to make CO2 and water. This is the reaction if you have a, a portable little, um, or like you have like a little portable uh, barbecue thing at home, you're probably using this reaction to create the energy to barbecue your <coughs> garden burgers or whatever you barbecue. But anyway, I digress. This reaction right now, if you look at it, has unequal atoms on both sides. So propane has three carbons right there, and there's only one right there. In chemistry, the law of mass action, or formally law of conservation of mass, is what chemists follow 99.999% of the time. We'll talk about the other 0.001% in Chem 222. But anyway, what that means, mass that goes in equals mass that comes out. And if you have three carbons going in, you have to have three carbons coming out, all right? You can't change the carbons into selenium or something like that. So that's where balancing equations comes in really handy. Now in balancing equations, you can see there's like these gaps right here. Those are for what we call the stoichiometric coefficients. All you have to know is that they're the big numbers in front that help you to, help you to balance the reaction. We don't want to change O2 to O3. We don't want to change H2O to H2O2, stuff like that. We're going to keep these as they are, but we can play with the numbers in front in any category we want. And since we can, this is another place now where fractions are kind of forbidden, all right? I'll talk about a technique that can be used where fractions are helpful, but we'll get rid of them at the end too and stuff because they're important. Now, there's lots of different ways to balance reactions, and all of you need to find what works for you. Some people just automatically, it's easy for them, other people struggle. So let me talk about some ideas to help you get through this. First of all, uh, notice in this particular reaction right here, oxygen is all by itself, all right? Like this is oxygen and hydrogen, oxygen and carbon, hydrogen and carbon. So I'm gonna balance oxygen last, because if I affect the oxygen right here, it won't affect any other elements, all right? If you change the number in front of water at the end, then both hydrogen and oxygen are messed up and it gets a little confusing. So try to do the oxygen last. Um, what I would do on a problem like this is I would just start kind of playing with it a little bit. Uh, oxygen last, so let's mess with the carbon. So propane has three right there. I'm going to put a big three in front of CO2 right there. And that will, at the very least, make your carbons balance. You've got three C's on the, in propane, and the big three means three carbons and six oxygens, as we'll talk about later, uh, in CO2. But the important part here is it looks then like carbon is good. Now, I need eight hydrogens. I only have two right here in water. Now, water always comes in twos for hydrogen, so if I put a big four right there, 
All right, well then I've got four times two, eight hydrogens. And that's good because I wanna have eight hydrogens. I wanna have that many there. Now, the only thing I haven't talked about yet is the oxygen. I'm gonna do that last because it's an element. And if you have an element, that's usually a good thing to do last. Now, oxygen is in both of these, so you have to add both of them up. So three times two is six, plus four times one, four. So six plus four, 10 oxygens are what I have on the right side. Oxygen, one of the diatomics, have no fear of ice clear brew. O2, we need 10 oxygen atoms, and it comes in pairs. So I'll put a five right there, and it looks like now that that's gonna be a balanced reaction. However, it's totally normal and very human, if I might add, to question yourself. Darn it. So this is a way that sometimes helps you to balance, make sure that you know you have a balanced equation. And you can always do it if you want to. You won't have to do it every time, but if you ever are uncertain, this is cool. And what I do is I draw a line down the middle between reactants and products, and I just list the elements that are in the problem. And if, I, if this is a balanced reaction, then the number of carbon, hydrogens, and oxygens on the reactant side, left side, should equal the carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens on the product side. So here's three carbons, like I said, so I'll put a three right there. Eight hydrogens, and five times two, 10 oxygens. So again, if my reaction is balanced, the right hand will have those same numbers. Let's figure it out. So three times one, three, all right, carbon looks good. Three times two, six from the CO2, okay. For water, four times two, eight, hydrogen looks good. And four times one, four, and sure enough, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, balanced. That's something you can always do. If you've done this before, it gets pretty chill, but if you're, if you're uncertain about a problem, always a good thing to check out. Any questions on this? All right, so now you can chuck yourself, woohoo, and woohoo, big surprise it is. Okay, now, there's not, an, there's not a one in front of C3H8, all right? That's not usually done in chemistry. Uh, if there's one, it's just listed as invisible, if you will. But the other ones that definitely get the numbers, and again, you can go through and balance. Some questions on that? This is an example of what we're gonna call a combustion reaction, which is a burning reaction. And there's actually lots of different versions of this. This, believe it or not, is also a type of combustion or burning reaction as well. It's a reaction where we're burning a boron compound and boron burns like a lot of compounds do, which is kind of weird. <clears throat> Oxygen, an integral part of burning, combustion. Anyway, you end up making water from the hydrogen, and the boron ends up making B2O3. That's like its version of carbon dioxide, if you will. Well, let's balance it. Woohoo! Knew that's what you wanted to do this morning. So, anyway, it's like before, all right? Oxygen, an element, I'm gonna do that last. And I'm gonna try and do the other parts first, and then at the very end, go back and see what's happening. All right. So B4H10, there's four borons there. B2O3 has two borons. What number do I want to put in front of B2O3? Two. two. That's right. Yeah, peace. I know, Clifford. But what's the number? No, I'm just kidding. That's a bad joke. Yeah, big two, right? Yeah, two is the number because then the borons cancel uh, or they're good to go, stuff like that. Okay. Ten hydrogens. Water has two hydrogens. You're going to want to put a five right there. Okay, and now the last thing to do is oxygen. So two times three, six, plus five times one. I right now have 11 oxygens, all right? And, oh, diatomics only come in pairs, all right? So if you get to this phase, it's really important to try to get rid of your fractions. What I would like to do is I would like to have 11 halves of oxygen there. Check this out. Because there are two oxygens in O2, and you can, if you had 11 halves, 
the 11 halves, the twos would cancel, and you'd have the 11 oxygens that you want, all right? But I was just battling about how chemists don't like fractions, and I don't want you to use fractions at this level either. So I'm gonna temporarily write 11 halves right here, all right, because that does make for a balanced reaction. But what we're gonna do now to get rid of that fraction multiply everything through by 2. So if I do that, 2 P4H10 and 11 halves times 2 becomes 11. 2 times 2 is 4 and 5 times 2 is 10. So if you get to that point where the diatomic, all right, like you have an, you want an odd number of them, uh, one thing that helps me is that odd number divided by 2 is what you want. And then if you multiply through by 2, you'll get rid of all that jazz. Now, at this point, Claire's probably like, Fussell, what are you doing? <laughs> Just because we haven't had all our caffeine yet doesn't mean you can do weird stuff. So let's go through and see if this reaction is balanced, all right? And I don't know if Claire's probably not doing it, but if you did, if you ever feel this way, totally cool. So. Again, a line down the middle, boron, hydrogen, and oxygen here. So 2 times 4, 8 borons. 2 times 10, 20 hydrogens. 11 times 2, 22 oxygens. And again, if we've done it right, now the other side will have those numbers too. Well, 4 times this 2, 8 borons. 4 times 3, 12 oxygens. 10 times the H2 in water would be 20 hydrogens, and 10 times 1, 10. And sure enough, 8, 20, 22 equals 12 plus 10. Bam, balance. So these are some tricks to help you with this, all right? Elements by themselves usually balance and blast. If you get to the point where you have an odd number of diatomics, and by the way, you gotta remember diatomics now, start with like 11 halves like we do and multiply everything through by two, good to go. Any questions? Okay, so this is an example of a problem you might see. Down here we have a reaction where we have phosphorus and chlorine. All right, and the gray atoms are phosphorus. Chlorine is another diatomic. Have no fear of ice clear. Brew, it's Cl2, okay? And it says what's happening in this reaction, all right? Well, on the product side, if this is phosphorus and these are chlorines, then that's a PCl3, all right? And there are four PCl3s on the product side. Now, <clears throat> On the reactant side here, you can see that to make a PCl3, it took one phosphorus and three Cl's. Uh, we're making not just one PCl3, but we're actually then making four PCl3s. So to make four PCl3s, you're gonna need one, two, three, four phosphorus atoms, and six times two, 12 chlorine atoms to make this happen. So the best answer here would be B. Any questions on that? Wait, is it six times two? Yeah. Wait. Chlorine, like oxygen, uh, is a diatomic, all right? And that's why, yeah, they come in pairs, all right? Now, phosphorus has got its own thing going on. <laughs> uh, we'll just talk about phosphorus as being an individual. Technically, it's a tetramer, it comes as four, but you don't need to worry about that, Clifford. I do want you to think about, though, the diatomics, and that's why I'm pointing it out. Excellent question. So when you're balancing reactions, all right, <clears throat> uh, try to balance those act those atoms which are only in one species last. So like O2 uh, is good. The f if you have a whole bunch of compounds, then the smaller number of atoms would be my recommendation. All right. In the last examples I did with boron and uh, propane, oxygen was a good example. And. Um, Another thing you want to do is if you have, like, uh, for example, up here with propane, you could have 2, 10, 6, and 8. 
So all of these coefficients times two, all right? And in chemistry, where we try and keep things as simple as possible, and I know you're probably laughing at me since the midterms today, but we try and keep them simple, all right? So the smallest whole number is always better. But fractions are bad, so don't go to the fraction level. But if you do have two, 10, six, and eight, just reduce them all down by two. Um, you can always check your answer, and especially if you're learning, having a line down the middle like that can be super helpful for things. So, um, Charges are balanced in a balanced reaction as well. And it's not so important right now, but in stuff we're gonna do in the future, knowing that can be kind of helpful. So like if you have a positive one on the reactant side, you'll have a positive one on the product side. We'll come back to this later, but for right now, as long as you see that at least the atoms have to be balanced, that's pretty good. Cool. Questions? Good. All right, so stoichiometry, which is a word you don't have to spell for me, but stoichiometry is literally the study of amounts coming together, all right? And for chemistry, this is critical. Chemists get paid because they want people to make something, all right? And all of this stoichiometry is basically around the law of conservation of matter, which just says that all the atoms that go in have to be taken account for on the way back out. You can't turn silicon to sulfur, you can't turn hydrogen to helium, and if you put five hydrogens in, you have to account for those five hydrogens on the way out. And that's why this whole balancing thing is so important. So in a balanced reaction, like this one right here, which is aluminum and oxygen making aluminum oxide, the four, the three, and the two are actually more important than you might have considered. Because really what they are is those are ratios between reactants and products, products and reactants, reactants to reactants, and all kinds of stuff. So for this reaction, there are actually six different ratios you can use. What I want you to know is, first of all, every time there's an O2, there's a 3 next to it. And that's because this 3 is by the O2. And every time there's an aluminum oxide, there's a 2 by it, because that's there. And aluminum always has 4. So you can literally think about these as 4 moles of aluminum per 3 moles of oxygen. That's what that one is. Sometimes, as we'll see though, it's nice to think about it as three moles of oxygen for every four moles of aluminum. These are like what we did with density, all right? Like you can turn density upside down, you can flip it around, do different things. Same kind of things, it's just that now we've got different variables. Um, these were reactant to reactant conversions, aluminum to oxygen, oxygen to aluminum. These over here are reactant to product conversions. So if we wanted to go from oxygen to aluminum oxide, we would use one of these right here. These would be for aluminum to aluminum oxide. So when you see these stoichiometries, they are very important because it tells you the relative amounts of things you need to put in in order to get stuff out. Or if you don't know what the reaction's doing, you'll be able to say, well, I made this much product, so I must have had this much reactant. A lot of powerful things in chemistry and stuff when it comes to this, and it's all dimensional analysis, but this time just based on the chemical equation. So we're gonna look at some examples of what you can do with these reactions here now coming up. But first, ammonia, NH3, can be made by nitrogen and hydrogen. So this question says, we have 10 moles of hydrogen, H2, and we want to see how much NH3 we can make if the N2 is in excess, and that'll be important. So if we have 10 moles of H2, we need a relationship between the H2 and the NH3, what we're starting with and what we want to make. So if you look at this reaction then, if we're starting with H2, that means in our relationship, we want hydrogen on the bottom. We want to get rid of hydrogen. A lot of chemistry is all about having units cancel out, okay? In this problem, we're starting with moles of hydrogen, and we want to have moles of hydrogen on the bottom. Hydrogen has a three right there, so we're going to divide by three moles of H2. And we want to figure out 
how much NH3 is going to be made. And NH3 has a 2 in front of it. So if you think about this long enough, you want this conversion to go from hydrogen to ammonia. And this is an example of what you would do, all right? This is the starting amount of hydrogen you have. And for every three moles of hydrogen, you're gonna make two moles of ammonia. So 10, and the H2 moles of H2 here are canceled by the moles of H2 here. You're gonna be left with just moles of NH3. That's how you would calculate this. Again, these numbers right here, direct from the balanced reaction, all right? That's this two, two right there, and this three right there. And since we're starting with H2, we want the H2 to cancel out. We'll put the three on the bottom, two moles NH3 on the top. Oops, I just turned it, my eye clicker on. Sorry about that. If you to... Question? So let's talk about a compound which has really good uses and also some unfortunately bad uses. And that compound is ammonium nitrate. Now ammonium nitrate is really cool for farming, growing things, all right? It's, put, it's a fertilizer, gets put in the soil, does cool things. Woohoo! Food is good. However, uh, Oklahoma City, 1991 or so, uh, this guy drove a writer truck into a federal building lit it on fire, ammonium nitrate was the source of a lot of the explosives. Totally ruined the whole building. Lots of people died, it was very, very sad. So ammonium nitrate, like a lot of chemicals, has both you know good force powers and bad force powers. Uh, just realize that uh, these things will do lots of things. Ammonium nitrate uh, reacts quite violently when, it, when you do it right, and it turns into dinitrogen monoxide, N2O, and also water. And along the way, a lot of energy is given off. So let's say that we had one pound, and I'm not even gonna use the pound here, but 454 grams is a pound of ammonium nitrate. If this 454 grams decomposes, reacts, the question is how much N2O and water are formed and what is the theoretical yield of products? Now as a chemist, your boss hands you 454 grams of ammonium nitrate and says, yo, what can you do with this? This is the kind of process you're gonna to do to figure out how much you're going to make, be able to make. And it's totally based on balanced reactions, we'll do grams per mole, but it's all stuff you've seen at this point, which is pretty cool. Okay, so on a problem like this, the first thing you need is a balanced reaction. Ammonium nitrate is your only reactant. N2O and water are your only products. Now, if you look at this long enough, there's two nitrogens, and N2O has two nitrogens, and takes away one of the waters, but then you have H4O2 left over, and water, of course, is H2O. So when you balance this reaction, you do have to add a two in front of the water, and that just makes the atoms that go into the reaction equal the atoms that come out of the reaction. And I encourage you, if you want, to later on go and see if you could balance this out, making sure you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Now, from a problem like this, you've got to start turning grams into moles. And in this chapter, if you see a gram amount, you might as well just turn it into moles right away, almost all the time, because it's what we're gonna do a lot. Now, ammonium nitrate, two nitrogens, four hydrogens, and three oxygens. If you add up all of those numbers, you get, for on the periodic table, you get the molar mass of ammonium nitrate. And it comes out to be about 80.04 grams per mole. So if we have 454 grams, well, grams of ammonium nitrate divided by grams per mole, the grams will cancel out, three sig figs, because we're putting three sig figs in. This represents 5.68 moles of ammonium nitrate. Okay. Any questions on that? Now, this is the amount that we're starting with in moles. All right, and from moles, we can use the balance reaction 
to figure out how much N2O is going to be made and how much water is going to be made. Because one mole of NH4NO3 is going to make one mole of N2O. The one to one numbers in front that are invisible, those, that's what that means. On the other hand, water, you get two moles of water for every one mole of ammonium nitrate. So once you have this number, we can start figuring out moles of products and then grams of products, stuff like that. So <clears throat> this ratio is going to be really important. The ratio between the reactant and whichever product you decide to pick. And in this example, I'm going to go after water first. It wouldn't be wrong to go after N2O first, but water is uh, a little bit more interesting. So I need what's called a stoichiometric factor, which is nothing more than a conversion from reactant moles into product moles. And so I'm looking at the one, invisible one, in front of the ammonium nitrate, and the two right there. And I can literally write two moles of water for every one mole NH4NO3. Because in the last part, we had, I think it was 5.68 moles of ammonium nitrate. So if we take this ratio and multiply it by moles of ammonium nitrate, those moles of ammonium nitrate will go away and we'll have moles of water. So let's do that. So in the earlier slide, we calculated that uh, 454 grams is 5.68 moles. For every one mole ammonium nitrate, two moles of water are produced. And again, that one is from right there. It doesn't show, but there is one there. The two is obvious right there, too. So what this means is that if we put 5.68 moles of ammonium nitrate in, we should be able to count to create 11.4 moles of water, twice the amount of the ammonium nitrate because of this two to one ratio. And that's pretty cool for chemists because it allows you to find the mole ratio of any kind of product you want. And it, ammonium nitrate is not, it's not the most expensive, but it's not the cheapest. So this would allow you to tell your boss or whoever you're working with how much would be made. Now, most of the world doesn't work on moles. What's wrong with them? Now, seriously, most of the world works on <clears throat> pounds, at least in the United States, unfortunately, or kilograms, whatever. So people will usually take the moles and turn them back into grams. Oh, by the way, uh, if you're curious about the moles of N2O, all right, well, the ratio of N2O to NH4NO3 is one to one. So if you have 5.68 moles ammonium nitrate, you're going to have 5.68 moles of N2O. I'll talk about this here in a little bit. Finally, notice that the moles of reactant are not equal to the moles of product, all right? The grams you put in will be equal to the grams that come out. But the moles of reactants and moles of products are often different, and that's okay. All right, we'll see why it's okay here. Okay, the theoretical yield is almost always the grams of a product that you should get out. So in this problem, we should, we have a 11.4 moles of water is how much we should get out. And water's molar mass, 18.02 grams per mole. So the moles of water cancel, we've got grams of water. And 204 grams of water is what chemists again call the theoretical yield. It's how much water you should get out, all right? We'll talk about why you don't always get that amount out, but in theory, if everything goes perfect, then you should get out 204 grams of water from this reaction. So to get this number, we went grams of reactant to moles of reactant. We went moles of reactant to moles of product water. That was the two to one ratio. And finally, we went moles of product to grams of product using the molar mass. This grams, moles, moles, grams is what I'm gonna call a dance because we're gonna do it a lot, all right? And you kinda gotta do it. You gotta follow these steps. I'll show you one or two tricks to get around it once in a while, but most of the time, grams, moles, moles, grams. So grams to moles, molar mass of the, what you're starting with. Moles to moles, the balanced reaction. Moles to grams, molar mass of what you're looking for. And we'll do that quite a bit in this section. 
Okay, so the other question, of course, though, is that there's more than one product. How much N2O is formed? All right. Well, this is one place where I can share a trick with you because law of mass action says all the mass that goes in has to be accounted for on the way back out. And we had 454 grams of ammonium nitrate and we just calculated with our grams, moles, moles, gram stands that there's 204 grams of water. So one way to do this problem would be to take the total mass and subtract the grams of water. And the remainder, which is 250 grams, is going to be the grams of N2O. This is one trick I can give you to get out of grams, moles, moles, grams. It doesn't work perfectly all the time, but it works more often than we might think. So if you have this kind of situation, if you're just missing the grams of one, say, product, then total mass in minus the grams of the other product will give you the grams of that stuff. We could have also said, all right, 5.68 moles of N2O is what we had, one to one with ammonium nitrate, multiplied it by the molar mass of N2O. That would be an alternate way to get this number. So either way is fine. This is basically grams, moles, moles, grams for the N2O, all right? And that way works all the time. But if you can use this, of course, it's a little easier. Any questions? Yeah. This is kind of a way to verify that law of mass action works. And we have a reactant and we have two products. So if you want, you could like write a line right down the middle. The initial and the final masses are the important parts here because how much you put in should be equal to how much you get out if you've done it right. And you can see in this version, that's totally it. Now, there's, we started with 5.68 moles of a reactant. We ended up with 5.68 moles of N2O and twice that number of moles of water. But at the end of the day, the grams that went in equal the grams that goes out. And that's what kind of chemists are after. So. 250 and 204 would be the theoretical yields of those products. So from 454 grams, we should be able to make 250 grams of N2O and 204 grams of water. Okay. However, the best laid plans of mice and men. So we're supposed to get 250 grams of N2O out, but N2O is usually a gas. It's the NOS and Fast and Furious, all that jazz I've been babbling about. Maybe we had the N2O and, oh, I opened the valve by accident and some of it went into the atmosphere. And with gases, that's very easy to do. So in this problem, we actually collected 131 grams of N2O. All right. Maybe it was someone being sloppy, like me opening the valve by accident. Maybe it was experimental. Who knows? But what we can do to talk about the efficiency of this reaction is to talk about the percent yield of the reaction. And the percent yield is nothing more than the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield. Now, the theoretical yield for N2O we saw earlier was 250 grams, and that's maximum amount of how much we should get out. But for whatever reason, we only got out 131 grams. This number is called the actual yield. All right, it's how much you actually got out of the reaction. So actual divided by theoretical times 100%. In this case, the percent yield was 52.4%. Now in academic settings, it's so easy to think, well, 90% higher is an A, so this is obviously an F, all right? Oh, bad reaction. It doesn't work that way though, because some reactions are really difficult to make them go. 52.4 uh, could be excellent. It could also be really poor. One time in graduate school, I called my parents in the middle of the night. I was so excited because I turned my blue compound into a purple compound. There's more to it than that, but that's what I did. Anyway, I was so excited and my percent yield, 4.3%. And I was ecstatic. And they were like, okay, you really should go to bed now, Michael. You know, you're not too late. But anyway, 4.3% was cool because no one had ever done it before, all right? And it was really difficult. It was sensitive to oxygen. It was sensitive to water. It was really a trip to make. But anyway, uh, that was a really exciting thing. Now, after a while, my percent yield went up a little higher. Not super high, but a little higher. 
On the other hand, the reaction, for example, we did last week, the empirical formula, percent yields are usually very, very close to 100%, almost 100% efficiency. So this number really just depends on the type of chemistry you're doing, all right? And percent yields, you have to know more about, uh, is this a good percent yield or is it bad? So here's just a reaction you can think about. Um, here's a reaction, theoretically, should have made 74 grams, but it actually only created 29.1 grams. And you can see there my focus on theoretical and actual. So percent yield is gonna be the actual amount that you got out divided by the theoretical amount that you should have gotten out times 100%. So if you want to do this math and you don't have to, it would be the actual 29.1 divided by the theoretical 74.0 times 100%, and it comes out to be answer E, about 39.3%. Any questions? This is a diagram we'll refer back to once in a while, and it shows the power of the stoichiometric factors in a reaction. Now, the stoichiometric factors, once again, are the relationships between reactants and products in a balanced reaction. So earlier we did C3H8 plus 5O2 making 3CO2 and 4 water. The stoichiometric factor could be like 5 oxygens to 3 o 2s something like that. But there's lots of ways to get to both what you're starting with and what you're ending with. And we've already seen how you can take the number of particles, atoms, molecules, and Avogadro's number to get to the moles. We do a lot of grams to moles using molar mass. But if you had the volume of the substance, you could take density and turn it into grams and it to moles. Woohoo! Next chapter, we're going to see how to take a volume of a solution and what's called the molarity and turn it into moles. So there's many different ways to get to those moles, and then you can use these stoichiometric factors from the balanced reaction to get to moles of the other piece. And then you can turn that into particles, or if you have the molarity, we can go to volume or mass, blah, blah, blah. We're going to do a lot of grams, moles, moles, grams, all right? And uh, so we're going to hit that pretty hard uh, in these sections. I call it a dance. It's not really a dance, but I feel kind of like dancing. Okay, prop that back on. Questions on... Hydrogen peroxide in water decomposes slowly at room temperature. In the presence of manganese dioxide, however, the decomposition occurs much more rapidly. The reaction produces gaseous oxygen and water. The hydrogen peroxide is oxidized and reduced at the same time. It undergoes a disproportionation reaction. The manganese dioxide serves only as a catalyst and is not consumed in the reaction. We're going to use manganese 4 oxide, not manganese dioxide, but anyway, I'm getting too excited here. We're going to use MnO2 in lab today. It's a really good catalyst. Catalysts make reactions happen faster than they would normally. So hydrogen peroxide, if you buy it at the store, it comes in a brown bottle. You're supposed to refrigerate it. Those keep it around longer. But if you really want it to decompose fast, put in a little MnO2, and it makes the transformation of H2O2 to water a lot more interesting to watch, obviously. At the end of this reaction, you could evaporate the water and get your MnO2 back. So catalysts don't actually react, they just help the reactants to go to products. Anyway, in this problem, they started with 5 grams of H2O2, and the question is how much O2 and water can be obtained. So if you wanted to do a problem like this, you'd start with 5 grams of H2O2 and turn it into moles of H2O2. Then, with this reaction right here, you'd use H2O2 to turn it into oxygen or water, and it doesn't matter. If you were after oxygen, you would use one mole of O2 on the top and two moles of H2O on the bottom. What you start with goes on the bottom, and what you want goes on the top. If you did water, it would be two to two. Anyway, then you can find the mass of O2, 2.35 grams, you can find this number, mass of water, either by 5 grams minus the O2, or you could go grams of H2O2 to moles, 
two to two times molar mass to get this number as well. This weekend, if you're not sick of chemistry and me, basically, you can try this on your own. I've given you the answers, all right? If you get stuck, let me know. Questions? Cool. Now, there's one more thing about chemical reactions that's super important, and that's called a limiting reactant. Limiting reactant slash limiting reagent are the same thing. And a limiting reactant is just something that stops the reaction before all the reactants are used up. And this is actually very important for different kind of chemical reactions. But before we talk about a chemical example, I want to do a practical example. Now, I'm a vegetarian, all right, so I'm going to say that these are veggie burgers, that you can use whatever meat source you want here, and I won't, I won't uh, throw up too many times. No, seriously, whatever you want to do is fine. So in my world, all right, let's say, oh, it's Friday, all right, done with the week and stuff. And, and I come home with my friends, and we're all really hungry, and I have in my freezer three veg veggie, bur veggie burgers. I have six half a dozen hamburger buns, and I'm a vegetarian, not a vegan, or maybe it's vegan cheese, who knows. But anyway, I have 12 slices of cheese, all right? And the goal here is to make the ultimate burger, all right? And in my world, the ultimate burger has a bun. It's got one veggie patty, but he meat with thing, and two slices of cheese, all right? Now... Depending on which of these ingredients you look at, you might be able to get different numbers as to how many ultimate burgers you want. So for example, three veggie burgers, yeah, we can make three of these ultimate cheeseburger things, no problem. But if you looked at the bun, six of them, then you'd say, mm, no, we can make six ultimate veggie burgers. But you don't have the veggie, bur the veggie burgers. You don't have enough of them. You've got six buns, but only three burgers, and each one of these has to have, apparently, a veggie burger inside it. So the buns uh, will still want to keep making more veggie burgers, but the veggie burgers limit what you've got. So we're going to be talking about limiting reactants. The veggie burger is the limiting reactant, all right? Because it allows you to only make three of these ultimate cheeseburger things. These guys want you to make six of them, all right, but you only have enough for three because of the veggie patties. And if you have 12 slices of cheese, two slices per three, you're gonna have six pieces of cheese left over. Now this is a really tacky example, all right, but it is something very practical. Like if you want four burgers and you only have three patties, mm, I don't think so, unless you wanna have like a cheese, cheese sandwich or something like that. But in this context, right, you're only making three. So the cheese and the buns are thinking you can make more of it than you actually can. Questions on that? Okay. This is a non-good-to-eat example of nitrogen monoxide reacting with oxygen to make nitrogen dioxide. Now, red is often oxygen. Nitrogen is blue nitrogen, all right? And if you look here in the reactant part, all right, you've got one, two, three, four NO molecules, and you have one, two, three O2 molecules. And at first, it might be tempting to say, you know, like, oh, wow, we've only got uh, three O2s, so that's going to be your limiting reactant. But if you look on the right-hand side, amazingly, you have one O2 molecule left. So is the oxygen limiting how much NO2 you can make if oxygen's there at the end? No. Oxygen, if something is left at the end, it's not the limiting reactant, limiting reagent, all right? This is an excess reactant like the buns and the cheese on the last example. The NOs, all four NOs are turned into NO2s, and we can explain that by looking at the balanced reaction. It takes two NOs and one O2 to make two NO2s. So for every one O2, you can make, you can react it with two NOs to make two NO2s. That's why like this oxygen reacted with these two and this oxygen reacted with these two, but one of them was still left over. 
So in this reaction, the limiting reactant is, again, the chemical that's no longer there. Limiting reactant is NO, all right? And the excess reactant, the thing that is left over at the end, O2. So this stoichiometry, the two to one here, makes a big difference as to what is limiting, what is excess. For this demonstration, we put three different amounts of zinc into the same amount of hydrochloric acid. At the end of the reaction, there is still some zinc remaining in the flask on the left. The reaction on the right did not generate as much gas because there was an insufficient amount of zinc. In the center reaction, the balloon inflated fully and all the zinc was consumed. Now, these three balloon examples here actually show the three kinds of things you can get into. Now, each of those containers has 0.100 moles of hydrochloric acid in it. And zinc and hydrochloric acid react to make zinc chloride, which is what we made last week too, but also some hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas fills up the balloons. Now, notice that the balloons on the left and the right about the same volume, all right? But the one on the right is certainly a lot less volume. Also, notice that there's some zinc metal left over on the far left flask. So what in this reaction happened? The middle one is the exact correct amounts. You had just enough zinc for that amount of HCl. And all the zinc reacted, all the HCl reacted, and made the big balloon good to go. On the left side, you had an excess of zinc. You can see the zinc is left over, so it's definitely the excess. And the balloon made, represents the HCl, made just as much balloon as the middle one did. So the HCl was the limiting reactant here, all right? It made the total big balloon, and there was still zinc left over. On the right side now, we didn't put enough zinc in for the amount of HCl. So there's no zinc left over. But notice how the balloon here isn't as big. That means the HCl, which was a constant, the HCl didn't totally react. So the HCl is the excess reactant here. The zinc is left over. Now, of course, we can't tell the HCl is left over because it's clear like water. But there is still some that's happening. Here are some amounts to go along with what I just talked about. Now, these are the amounts of zinc that we put into these different ones. And you can see how the left, there's a lot. The right, there's not as much. This is in between. So here's the gram amounts, and I turned them into moles. So I divided by 65-ish grams per mole. Now, in the reaction, one mole of zinc needs two moles of HCl. And in each of the reactions, we put 0.1 moles of HCl. So you can see in the middle, this was the perfect combination. Two HCLs for every one zinc. 0.1 divided by 0.05 would be it's equal to two divided by one, all right? But over here, we didn't put enough zinc in, and here we didn't have enough HCl for the amount of zinc that was put in. So what that means then is we use, we can figure out if you want a ratio between the HCl and the zinc or either way. Two to one is what we're looking for. 0.1 divided by 0.05 is certainly two. Here, the ratio was a little less and here it was a little bit more. So that means over here, zinc was limiting how much we could make. Here, the HCl limited how much it can happen. Now, all of these are examples of things you'll run into chemistry. Sometimes you'll have perfect amounts, which is nice. Sometimes you'll have HCl as your limiting reactant. Sometimes it'll be the zinc that's the limiting reactant. But if you can figure that part out, it makes it pretty cool. Any questions? Not yet. Okay, <laughs> not yet, I like that. Uh, this is going to be a good place to stop. Uh, I'll take up more of this stuff on Monday. All right, I'll see you guys at 1.10 p.m. Have a great day.